Hey, what's up everyone? So as you can see, it's a new episode with a guest today because I am with Antoine Vanderly. Welcome Antoine. Thank you. Welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing good. And you? Yeah, I'm doing great. So thank you for being here with us, Antoine, today. And I think we're going to be talking about a very cool topic, which is dependency injection and how we can implement, we could say, a modern dependency injection syntax in Swift. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a super hot topic and you can easily spend a lot of time on discussing several solutions. So, well, let's actually get started. So maybe you can give us like uh, some context on uh, why did you have to take a look at this issue? Yeah, so I guess um, recently at WeTransfer, we have been growing the team. Uh, we started a new application. And every time when you start a new project, you want to revisit your current app structure. Uh, because obviously, when you build an app, you run into issues that you want to solve and prevent when you start a new app. So uh, I think a few weeks ago, we, we started the whole journey of looking into several kinds of de dependency injection solutions. Um, and yeah, that resulted in this article you see right here. But um, yeah, I would love to take you a little bit, a little bit back on the journey we took because obviously you don't always directly want to jump on a custom solution uh, when there are great uh, examples out there. So um, I prepared a few uh, repositories that we looked into. Uh, for example, Stringject, which had the downside for us that it was not compile time, uh, giving feedback whether or not a dependency would would exist. So you could easily run into crashes. Um, then there is Uber with a needle. Uh, which kind of solves that, but it comes with code generation, which we really didn't want to depend on. And it was a bit less predictable in a way. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go into details about these frameworks. They are great for, for others, but they just didn't really uh, solve the thing that we wanted to solve. And then lastly, there is the point free uh, environment struct that we looked into. Um, and this might not be directly related to dependency injection, but one of the problems we wanted to solve is that, you know, we had a big app delegate with all uh, relationships to dependencies and stuff, which made it really hard to um, to test our dependencies, right? Um, and the environment struct of point three is a really interesting approach to solving that. But yeah, th this is all listed out uh, in this article where I go over like, why would you need dependency injection? And it's basically just like a summary of the meaning we had at, uh, at WeTransfer. So of course, all the links that you are that you have just shown us, uh, they are in the description if you want to take a look at them. Yeah, exactly. Makes total sense. But um, yeah, for this video, let's just dive into the solution that I uh, wrote for my article. It's super interesting because yeah, we just discussed before we started this recording that you know uh, this solution is is touching quite some uh, some features of Swift, uh, which is super exciting. Exactly. And so you're going to see watching the video that Antoine is going to be using things like uh, custom subscript, property wrappers. So we are not going to go into details how these well feature of Swift work, but every time you will see a video appearing and you just have to watch the video to get uh, like, uh, if you don't know the feature, understand how it works. So don't be scared. You will have all the explanation you need. Exactly. So uh, yeah, that's uh, definitely solvable. Um, but yeah, I'll, uh, I'll just take you over the solution that, uh, that I've written. And uh, it basically comes down that we want to inject a network provider in our code. Um, and in the case of test, we want to inject a mocked network provider so we can easily uh, mimic the way our test would work. So we have a protocol network providing with a simple request data. Um, and we have two uh, samples where we have the actual network provider and we have a mocked version of the network provider. And for the sake of this demonstration, I created a print statement where we can actually see that the dependency injection worked in the end. So the first step, what we do is um, we create a protocol uh, and that protocol kind of enforces any implementers to have a backing store for the injected value. What we wanted to solve is, you know, those shared instances everywhere around were kind of hard to, to mock, right? So yeah. what we now have is um, a backing store in a way with a mutable static variable, and we can uh, use the implementation later to change this to the mocked network provider. So with the injection key protocol, um, it's good to point out, by the way, that there's an associated type value um, and that basically will result into the network provider value that we are going to inject. Yeah, and I think we can also see that. So in the in the variable in which you store the, uh, the instance, we can see that it's not an optional type. So we are already starting to see like some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, type safety at compile time. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, by default, it's just our network provider. So whenever you use this value in the code, 
uh, you, you will always have a value to work with, which is super nice. So yeah, um, then we come down to the uh, injected value structure. Um, and this is really kind of like a common accessor to all the injected values. Um, and this is really valuable to either overwrite injected values or to um, yeah, get the injected value inside a property wrapper, for example, which uh, I'm going to show in a bit. It uses a few um, techniques here. Uh, we have a private static for, um, which is private on purpose because we really want to enforce to access any um, related data through the subscripts we created. Um, this technique is pretty nice as well. It's a static subscript, um, which makes it more easy to reason about. And it uses two um, subscripts for a reason. One, we have the writable key path, which basically allows to reference any uh, values through a key path that's also mutable. Uh, and we also have uh, a type subscript, which is basically really only used in the implementation we see here. The whole idea behind this implementation is from the environment values, which we know from Swift UI, which is really nice if you look into the property wrapper where you can use the key path um, to uh, yeah, access any environment values. And that's kind of what I wanted to mimic. So here we created an extension, um, which is not uh, static. And uh, through the subscript, it's accessible as we can use the current within the uh, isolated environment of the injected values. And we use the key path, which will eventually be the network provider to set either a new value or to get the current value. And uh, here you can see that we uh, come back to the network provider key that we referenced earlier. Yeah. So um, yeah, we can access the backing store kind of to either read out the current value or to update the current value. So with that in place, uh, we got basically all the building blocks to uh, create a nice property wrapper. In a way, the property wrapper is really a convenience method because otherwise you had to talk with the injected values subscript everywhere. Yeah, it's, it's less swifty. And especially if you want to use this in Swift UI, you know, uh, property wrappers are uh, everywhere there. So it's super nice to have this in place. So what we see here is um, the wrapped value is really making use of the injected values convenience backing store. And the same key path is used again to either get the value or update the value. So in a way, it's really repetitive code doing a lot of the same things, but it's really making use of it together to create a convenience property wrapper. Exactly. Like you said, it's, uh, it's uh, syntax sugar. Basically, you could do without it, but uh, with it, the syntax becomes just uh, so much better and so much also like more aligned with uh, SwiftUI. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, this is actually how it looks in the end, right? So we have the in, uh, injected property wrapper and uh, this is like the key path, right? So this references back to the uh, network provider value we have here in place. So whenever you want to add another dependency, you basically create another extension on injected values and on the injected key, and you can create another uh, injectable dependency. And like you said, so if you know SwiftUI and you know environment values, uh, the syntax, it looks extremely, extremely similar and uh, the way it's implemented under the hood also, so we can definitely see the familiarity there. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and the nice thing is that, you know, um, the value is inferred uh, from the, the default value that is there, uh, which defaults to the network provider, which we saw before. Um, and in code, we can directly just access the request data. And if we um, are going to look into how this works, uh, I added it into comments, but we can actually run it and see how it works. So let's see what's going to happen. Yeah, so what, what, what I did, right? So um, at first we have the data control with a network provider. And as we didn't inject any other values, it defaults to the network provider as we saw earlier. Which is like a feature that you wanted to have a default value this way, like you're sure that in production, it cannot crash because the code cannot compile without a default value. Exactly, so this is our compile time safe, which is one thing we wanted. Um, yeah, and here we can see that we use the, uh, uh, the key path once again, and the injected values common accessor to the backing store um, to overwrite the current injected value. We set it to the mock network provider. And the nice thing is if we um, use the property wrapper getter, uh, you can see that it prints out the mock network provider, but you could in theory in code also uh, run this without the property wrapper uh, and just access the injected value through the static subscript that we created earlier. And that will return the mock network provider as well. Um, and this is using the same code as the property wrapper, uh, but the property wrapper kind of does this for you. Yeah. It's more convenient. So once we uh, injected 
the mock network provider, we can perform the data request again. And you can see that the data requested is now using the mock network provider. Um, and that's the print statement that we uh, configured earlier on. Another nice thing is um, that we can use the property wrapper as a setter as well, which is really convenient if you want to uh, inject the value from within the class. There's not many scenarios, I think, that you would do this, especially if you're working with shared instances. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's good to demonstrate that property wrappers allow this. So um, we here inject basically the network provider back again. So we're no longer mocking it in a way. And once you print that out, you can see that it's printing out the network provider as we have overwritten it using the property wrapper wrapped value. And then lastly, to really prove that it's true, um, you make the code on the data request again. And you can see that the print statement is printing out that we used the network provider instead of the mocked network provider again. So mission accomplished. And uh, like you said, yeah, what, what I found really nice with this solution is that uh, it takes an issue that everyone has in their app at some point, like doing dependency injection, and it solves it by taking all of the new features of Swift, the pattern of Swift UI, and putting it all together and creating this, a solution that is very, we could say, uh, idiomatic. Yeah, exactly. Um, there might be a learning curve to it, but I think if you uh, just focus on the implementation level where you only work with the uh, the property wrapper and the injected value static subscript. Um, the learning curves should be relatively small, as these are features that you will see in other places of the code as well, especially when working with Swift UI. Exactly. Like I can tell you, like when I read your, your article, I think the hard part is understanding how the key path and the backing store works. But yeah. once you have all of that in mind, you've understood how it works under the hood. And anyway, like the public API that you expose doesn't even like. Uh, need you to understand it. So to use it, uh, it can be very like, uh, yeah, the plug and play, but uh, kind of. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, it's it's harder to demonstrate it in a playground, um, but I intentionally uh, put quite some private uh, uh, keywords in there as well, right? So the network provider key is private, for example, it's just a backing store. So it doesn't necessarily have to be visible on implementation level, which um, lowers the risks of errors as well. So you really set up the code, make it possible to inject dependencies. And on implementation level, you only work with the injected values combined with the property wrapper. And so I guess I can only encourage anyone who is watching and who's interested to go read the description of the video because there is the link to your article with the code and you can try it out and see well uh, if it could work in your app, if it could solve some, uh, some issues. And uh, basically, if you like the syntax, uh, why not give it a try? Exactly. Everything that we uh, covered today is demonstrated in the articles. So, well, thank you again, Antoine, for giving us this, uh, this explanation. So for people who don't know, you have a blog with a lot of cool articles. So the link is also in the description. And if you've never been on Antoine's blog, uh, definitely go check it out because you are sure to find at least one article that is going to help you in the problem that you currently have uh, in your code. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> And so, well, thank you. Thank you for being here with us today, uh, Antoine. Yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me over. It was a pleasure. And thank you all for watching this video. And uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.